Thanks, Alyssa. Um, welcome, everyone, to the 20, this 2024 State of the City. Uh, we're talking largely about 2023, the last year's uh, challenges and successes and the ongoing projects the city is working on. Um, thanks very much to the Jefferson County Chamber of Commerce for uh, uh, putting this event on and for the Port of Port Townsend for providing us with what is one of the best meeting spaces in, in Jefferson County uh, here. Um, so what we're going to do today is, uh, as I mentioned, talk about about this last year. And uh, I'm hoping that we'll do, you know, John, who is our city manager, John Morrow, is going to talk about um, kind of the operational pieces, the things that are were, were done over the last year, and then I want to hopefully hold a good chunk of time for question, answer, and discussion. So I think that's my favorite part of these these events. Not that I mean, John is a font of information, uh, but gotcha. but it's great to have the opportunity to interact with uh, the community in these events. Um, so, John, you want to take us through uh, the presentation? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Oh, this one works, doesn't it? Oh, awesome. Okay. Look out. Um, I will so, pass the microphone. This is not. Yeah, let's pass that. Um, <laughs> Maybe I could just um, amplify literally uh, what Mayor Faber just said and thank the chamber and the port um, and both great partners to the city and, and actually a lot of partners to the city right here. I'm looking at a couple of them right now. Um, and, and I guess, you know, we work really closely with Port Port Townsend. It's, it is an awesome space. So thank you, Aaron, for being an awesome partner to the city um, and letting us use the space. Um, I also want to thank Alyssa Rodriguez, who is our city clerk, who's um, actively at USB port capacity. And that's why she's going to be advancing slides because she's got as much going on as here as she can and has done all the setup. Um, and Shelly Levin is our communications director who has really made this event possible. Um, so thank you and thank those who also participated in this together. It's the first time we've done this in person, at least since I've been here. And that's been about four and a quarter years. So it's really great to see real people have real exchanges with people that are not two dimensional on the screen. Um, and as Mayor Faber said, um, to really kind of get to that part of this um, as soon as we can so we can actually share some conversation and some ideas together. So um, I also wanted to um, point out on the table over there, there was, speaking of Shelly Levins and the work that she's been doing with the city, uh, in partnership with other department directors and the staff, this is the first quarterly the city's put out in the PT leader, um, the first of, of four this year because it's a quarterly. And you can pick up a copy if you didn't already um, and get a sense of what we're doing. There's some perennial themes. Um, have a look, let us know what you think. We'll be probably designing the next one very shortly. Uh, you'll find that in about a quarter from now. Um, and also, I think there are some newsletters. They're usually um, you know, electronic. They come into your inbox, but they are also printed out on the table. So go have a look at those uh, and have a read. So um, let's move to the next slide and let's talk about a couple of things today. So if we can, yeah, Mayor Fair, we already covered this, but we'll talk about kind of what we felt last year were our successes. And then, you know, honestly, a few of our major challenges, and that could be a part for us to kind of get into as a, you know, as a, as a group here um, of kind of what, what are challenges and lessons learned we want to carry forward. Um, what are we thinking about for next year, which is really this year now? So what are our aspirations uh, for this year? Um, some of them already in motion, um, and, then, and then that discussion. So um, just to, to, this is mostly photos because I don't think you want to read text on a screen. Um, but this one is it just top level 2023. Um, this is not everything, but these are six things I feel like we as a community can be proud of that we accomplished this year. Uh, the first one might seem like gibberish. It was actually a really important project that we did mainly internally. Um, around financial sustainability. And it was a multi-year effort that culminated in a report by a task force, of which a few members are here today, so thank you task force members, um, that was delivered to city council and really set us in motion for how we address what every city is going through right now, which is an existential crisis with limited and diminishing uh, revenue capacity and increasing needs. And how are we gonna navigate that as a community over the next several decades? That report doesn't solve the problem for us, but it certainly puts us on a trajectory for stability. And um, they actually delivered quite instantly afterward a transportation benefit district that you as voters approved by about 80% to fund uh, our local street network. 
It's a really big piece of work that involves pretty much everything we do strategically as a city, and it was really great to see that finish and kick off a series of videos. Can I just ask who's seen those videos? Don't be shy if you've seen them. If you haven't and you, your hand's not up, go check them out. They're on a YouTube page. Some of them are three minutes long, um, and you can kind of get through them pretty quickly. Um, they, they take you through some basics on sewer, um, on streets, on parks, um, and the like. The second thing I already mentioned, so I won't do it again. Um, it's kind of a big deal for our community because we've had 20 minutes or 20 years of kind of no investment in our local network. Um, the third is um, finalizing and adopting the Evans Vista Development Master Plan, which is another big deal. I don't think the city's um, ever purchased 14 acres of land. Um, all of the state grant actually received a two and a half million dollar federal um, appropriation for a sewer lift station and it started to design what a neighborhood could look like in Evans Vista. I'm realizing because each of these is a political move, but I need to turn to my left to make sure <laughs> there's ample time for political commentary too. Uh, but Evans Vista really is, um, it's a big game changer for us with the master plan being done, um, a complicated series of next phases. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Pausing. I think we'll have plenty of time to talk about these topics, perhaps in the uh, Q&A. Okay. Great. Um, the fourth one I wanted to mention is um, tactical infill. Um, some of you, I'm um, foreshadowing, I'll talk about the comp plan, which is our big priority for this year. Um, but tactical infill was a big piece of work we did last year to unlock zoning capacity and really think about middle housing in a way that we haven't necessarily thought about for many decades here in town. Um, and that really builds to the comprehensive plan update that we're doing this year and next. The fifth thing is, um, you know, it was really fun to go out to the golf park yesterday with my family um, and walk around and feel welcome to the golf park, uh, play some disc golf, um, see, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, gather at a bonfire, listen to music, um, really making that a community amenity um, beyond golfing and actually still keep golfing for those who really adore the fact they can play a local club. Um, that was um, a pretty big accomplishment last year, which required a lot of effort and probably some of you participating because I think there were something like 3,200 survey results in our small town of 10,000. So a lot of people had their say, and I think we got to a middle ground um, that works generally for most everyone. If you haven't gone out to the park, um, it's yours. It's city property, so it's collectively ours. Go check it out. And then the last one I want to mention, because I'm sure you're driving around it or on it and feeling like, what are we doing here, um, is a Discovery Road project, a multi-year effort. Um, it's a five and a half million dollar project with almost really no city investment. I mean, we staff time, a little bit of match, but federal state funding that really got us to complete redesign of that road, including bike and pedestrian facilities, um, pedestrian facilities on both sides of the road, um, a cycle track from Sandwich Coast to the Rio Roundabout. And that's what all that uh, construction is about right now. Um, right now, that's aiming to be done in, in May or June of this year. You'll be able to uh, celebrate with us when that's complete. So that's just a quick highlight of six things. It's not all of the things we've done, but it's six things that we have done this past year. Um, that kind of go through the gamut of parks and streets and housing, kind of our core priorities. Um, and then the rest of it really is just photos illustrating um, some of those accomplishments before we talk about what's on tap this year. So more quickly now through the photos. Um, I'm going to go by theme. There are seven themes in our strategic work plan um, year on year. The first one is investing in our people. And so you can see um, hiring and retaining um, really good staff is pretty much how we're going to win anything in the city of Fort Townsend. Um, it's really about the people. Um, and so we've been really lucky to hire and actually keep a lot of folks. We have folks who've been in the city for many, many years and folks who just joined. Um, and uh, the combination is really uh, powerful. So uh, investing in people means treating our staff well, um, attracting great talent and retaining them. Retaining them. Sorry, go ahead. Um, yep, just more of that. Um, this is a swearing in ceremony at city council, um, new police officer. And then the next one is actually, um, you know, not just the city staff, but volunteers and partner agencies um, who do a lot of work on, on your behalf um, for the city. So just thinking outside the box, not just city staff and our people, but who is our people? It's really everybody. It's everybody in this room. It's everybody that volunteers and partners with the city. Um, that's how we're going to move the dial. The other thing we do is we engage our community. Uh, this is one of those such events. Um, and uh, for instance, um, you know, Mayor Faber, the newsletter, first Friday coffees that I do, uh, weekly radio show. I think I just saw the GM of uh, 
APTC had jumped in. Um, you know, these are ways that we try to create touch points with the community so we can engage and dialogue about uh, our future. Here. Engaging with our community also means new programs. Um, this is our Poet Laureate, um, our first ever Poet Laureate. Um, Connor Bouchard Roberts, who um, has been active, um, quite active actually, um, even in this last week, uh, doing poetry readings and really engaging the community, uh, really on behalf of a program that the city started with the uh, Port Townsend Arts Commission. So that, let that be a proxy for other ways that we engage the community. I don't have, I probably can share a lot of pictures, but we'll go to the next one. The next one is strengthening our financial position. I mentioned this early, uh, earlier, um, but you can go to this four-part video series. Uh, there's little clips to each of them on the right, um, and that really tells the story of, okay, what what is the next 10 or beyond, you know, 10, 20 years look like from, um, you know, we, we have to balance a, a budget that's state law. Um, we have to be responsible with city resources, but how do we get through some of those existential challenges with infrastructure, for instance, that have been left for, uh, for too long, frankly? Uh, of course, that also means, like I said, the budget, the budget brief, that, that right document is um, now available uh, for if you want the kind of you know, couple page version of what the budget looks like for 2024, you can get that online. You're doing an awesome job anticipating my pauses. Thank you. <laughs> I don't pause. Um, and then, of course, we crack through a number of challenging um, community decisions around things like the future of the golf course. So this is Mayor Faber. Uh, addressing a crowd of um, engaged folks at, at one of the many open houses we did on the golf course. We did the same thing with um, the aquatics, uh, helping you together. I think we even have a picture of us signing the agreement. Yeah, you can go to the next one um, with the friends of the Port Towns Golf Park. Um, and like I said, we're, we're kind of midway through, um, but you know, really get the, the first um, report finished and um, really a view of what, what could it look like for aquatics if we were to find a, um, a way to build a facility in the region. We also are embracing resolving challenges that have really vexed us for a while. Um, I'd say housing is pretty much top of that list, although there's probably a number. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, this is the conceptual rendering from Evans Vista neighborhood. Um, we haven't you know, built anything yet. In fact, the city doesn't build things. Uh, it'll be uh, not us building it, but we did finalize that master plan. And it really is quite a, um, I mean, I don't, this is my maybe personal opinion, refreshing change to how things look on the ground for Townsend. Um, you know, this is density, it's walkability, it's use of resources in a way that uh, makes sense to house people who can live and work in the same community, uh, it reduces our vehicle miles traveled by folks who are commuting in. Many of my team commuted from other counties, actually, uh, to Jefferson County to work for the city. So. How do we build workforce housing and attainable housing for people here? This is one big thing the city's trying to do. Uh, of course, a lot of engagement with that last year um, to get to the master plan, and clearly a lot of engagement as we press go. Um, from here on. More about that later. Um, I mentioned tactical infill. This is an example um, of um, the first tiny house on wheels that uh, was permitted in Fort Townsend. We were the second community in the state to allow this, um, and it was great to have a community member pick it up pretty quickly and do a, a very uh, uh, gentle ribbon, ribbon cutting. Um, this is actually on F Street, um, and somebody's already living in the tiny home on wheels, and you also can apply for and um, have one uh, as well as a, as a real effort to increase density and to reduce housing costs to allow uh, people to live and work in the same community. And then there's delivering the basics, everything from, look, we're paving streets now. This is a result of our bank capacity project, and soon our transportation benefit district will be actively looking at local roads to fix stormwater systems and to um, do some, some repaving. This is 24th, I believe. And I put a lot of streets ones on here because that seems to be what people speak to most. Um, there's a lot more than just streets and delivering the basics, but here, here's an edge road on Coon Street. Pretty cheap fix. Um, here's kind of a network of road projects we uh, were getting at this this past year. And then, of course, every other department delivering the basics. You know, just public safety. It's a huge piece of what all cities deliver. Uh, ours is no different. I would like to believe we have uh, perhaps one of the best police teams anywhere around. Um, and we we really prioritize community policing, so we do it differently than a lot of communities. Um, but that's that's a lot of where your taxpayer dollars go to keep ourselves safe and uh, 
connected through a lot of the programs that our police team does. I could say the same thing about our planning team, our library, uh, our legal team, um, pretty much everything in the city is, uh, you know, operationally, if you go to the next slide, I think about 90% of what we do aren't flashy initiatives. They're things you can't read because there's too much on a slide to understand what we do day in and day out um, to deliver on your behalf. All right, I'm gonna just maybe pause there. Should I keep sprinting to the Q&A, Mr. Mayor? Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> I wanted this is a provocative photo here, so I wanted to kind of get to, you know, let's be honest, not everything was puppies and rainbows in 2023. So we want to have an honest conversation about, you know, where, where are some of the misses that we had, um, whether they were our misses and, you know, the current administration or misses from years past, kind of doesn't matter. Um, we just need to kind of keep moving forward from where we are. Um, and of course, that's a Carmel being, being, building being torn down, which is a great symbol of uh, maybe some mistakes and some, you know, un, unforeseen challenges that we, uh, we had to kind of cut through. Um, so I, I'll, I'll note that that is one of them. And we, you know, that building no longer is up. Um, and there is a general plan forward for how to make that available for, um, ideally for density, um, for, for housing. Um, that's still in motion, but with a real trajectory forward. So I'm not saying that mess is cleaned up, but we learned a lot um, and we're, uh, we're getting toward, uh, toward progress there. But the three examples I wanted to show you um, really illustrate um, kind of a wide variety of challenges we've had. And to speak honestly um, about some of the misses. So, um, you know, the first thing I'll mention is the Healthier Together Aquatics Initiative. Um, you know, whatever your opinion about, I'm going to guess there's probably about 60 opinions in the room and online at least about whether that was good or bad or how well we did. One of the one of the things we um, realize is that um, you know any little kernel of lack of clarity is an opportunity for for a wedge to be driven through, and I think um, you know misinterpretation is fair game because I misinterpret stuff all the time. Um, but when it's leveraged to, you know, to drag down a project, I think that's where we, we learned some lessons this year about, or this past year especially, about how we can probably provide more clarity in open session. We had stakeholder meetings, we had public, um, you know, governing body meetings at city council, at board commissioners, at other bodies. We um, had town hall meetings. We did a lot to engage the community on this. But down the wire, the last couple months of the year, we probably could have taken this more frequently to say city council so that misunderstanding or lack of information around reports there are some you know reports that people were concerned about um, we can kind of nip that in the bud um, and speak to what might be confusing or misunderstood so that it doesn't kind of snowball i think that's something we learned around that initiative again maybe that's just a, a hook for conversation later uh, today the second major challenge at three is um look there's there's a lot um outside of control one of those things timing with sort of national markets, <laughs> uh, interest rates that have never been at uh, this high for you know, 20 years. Um, so you could be planning, we've been planning the Evans Vista project since 2020. Um, I remember sitting down with our public works director, uh, Steve King, uh, representative Steve, Steve Ferringer and saying, we need money for this project. How do we work this through? And that became a capital grant that we got from the, uh, from the state. Um, we didn't think we'd be in this position of, you know, almost uh, impossible interest rates for development right now. Um, and so I guess one of the things we learned is, well, it's not going to stop us from doing the project or time it differently. And from the beginning, it's urgent. Housing is a critical need for our community. Um, but one of the things we can do is maybe articulate why we're pausing now um, so that people understand that we're trying to be opportunistic. So, for instance, going out to bid for a developer to actually make that vision possible right now would be probably folly because no one's gonna pick up on that project when it's almost impossible to fund a project. If we were to do the background work these next few months and keep working on the vision, thinking about infrastructure and working our state and federal grants, we might be in a great position, you know, maybe four or five months from now. And so we wanna be ready for that. I think we've learned, while we can't control the timing, we can communicate that better to the community about why we're waiting and why that's beneficial for all of us. The third one is, you know, we go kind of fast. I, I think I'm, at least I try to be quick and efficient in what I do. Um, and look, I, I run with a team that's um, whip smart and, and really fast. Um, and it's exciting. And I think something like the Financial Sustainability Initiative, one of the most strategic things our community, our city has done, I, I, I'd say probably almost ever, 
was super exciting because we're, we're unifying a theory of everything together. However, we got to keep doing all the other stuff. We got to keep the, the lights on. Well, I guess that's the PUD, but we got to keep the streets running and the, the water running. I mean, there's a lot of operational needs that get balanced with the strategic. And I think what we learned this year is we can do all of it, but there are um, opportunity costs, there are um, trade offs. And so if we try focusing just on the strategic, we probably can't deliver as well on the operational. And if we you know, we only focus on the operation. We're going to be doing the same thing over and over and not thinking about the big picture. So balancing that better is important, not just to get better outcomes for you, but actually so we don't burn out our team. And I saw that happen with a lot of members of my staff, some of whom don't work for the city anymore because we are frankly just going too fast. Um, I'm going to always try to go as fast as we can um, because these problems are urgent. But I think if we lose people off the bat, then that's, that's going to hurt us in the long run. Those are the challenges. And then a few slides about what we're going to do this year, what's well, already in progress, and then we can have a dialogue. Um, so biggest thing, if I were to plant one seed in you today, it's please participate in the comprehensive plan update. It's probably the single most important thing we're gonna do this year into next year. And it's the vision document for what the 20, next 20 years look like for the city of Fort Townsend. Uh, whether you care about Climate change, inequality, housing, parks, it doesn't, streets, doesn't matter. It's all going to show up in this document and it's going to guide us forward for what we're going to be as a community. So, um, you know, 2045 seems like a long way away. Uh, uh, it'll quick. And we got to do a lot of the planning now to get to the 2045 that we all feel proud of, our kids, our grandkids feel proud of. So, that's something that we're actively, you know, you can look at it in, in the quarterly we put out. Um, you know, we have a website that's just up for you to engage with, and there'll be opportunities throughout the year to get involved. Please get involved. We really need you. And then there's everything else. So these are the seven categories I ran through earlier. I don't expect you to read it, um, but in those categories, I'll give you a couple examples of what we've got going on this year, and then we can break for Q&A. So investing in our people means a new staff engagement. Um, program, which we're starting actually on Wednesday, kicking off formally. Um, we negotiate our union contract this year for general government. Um, we're looking at IT readiness and cybersecurity, which is something we've been doing for a while. Um, that's really investing in our people, um, you know, really critically for us. Um, engaging with our community, we'll continue to roll out how your city works programs, videos. Um, we've got now an actual communications function in Shelly Levins. We've never really had that before. To the capacity that Shelly can deliver. So thinking about integrated communications, um, it's it's going to help all of us know how to plug in better with our community, how do you how, how how you can plug into the city business and actually uh, impact the outcomes, um, particularly the comprehensive plan. There's our financial position. So we're going to continue to deliver on the financial sustainability initiative. Uh, we're looking at facilities. We did some kind of clever stuff in this year's budget where we're um, using, we have a healthy reserve balance. I don't wanna to go into too much detail on this. Ask me questions after, but we have a healthy reserve balance even though everything's crumbling. So can we use that, the council adopted, using that reserve balance partly, a little bit of it, to fund a facilities program where it's an ongoing investment. So it's a rotating fund for facilities so that when things break, which this weekend they did at the pool, we have a funding source to fix it. And then it keeps on feeding itself because we're getting ahead of the maintenance response. It's a really good savvy budget move. Uh, a lot of kudos to Connie Anderson, our former finance director for that, and for council for saying yes. Um, of course, the, the TBD, the Transportation Benefit District, that funding starts to come in to the city on April 31st. We're gonna put that every penny to good use. Um, and then a few other things in financial position, including things like economic development, which really moved the dial for, uh, for the city in the long run. Uh, our sustainable future, thinking about the complement update, like I mentioned, a lot of housing initiatives, continuing to implement the golf park um, uh, agreement. Uh, and then a number of, uh, I'm noticing a number of acronyms I mistakenly threw in there, assuming people know what an SMP and a CAO is. I'm really sorry, you don't. Um, the Shoreline Master Program Critical Areas Ordinance and RCO is a Recreation Conservation Office. We apply for funding with the state um, to basically fund uh, parks improvements in the city. A couple more, embracing our challenges, um, you know, really thinking about strategic action around housing. We've got some work there. Um, and, uh, you know, I have to tip to the port and their leadership around sea level rise and community amenity um, 
and an attempt, hopefully, to apply for a federal FEMA grant, RIC grant, um, this this year. And then delivering the basics. You know, we're, we're going to complete Discovery Road, like I said, by May or June. Um, we're going to be uh, assessing the Olympic Gravity Water System. That's what the GWS is. Uh, pipeline. That's our water supply. Um, we're going to be uh, coordinating on the Sims Gateway and Boatyard Expansion Project with our partner support PPP. Uh, replacing sewer infrastructure on Water Street, uh, unfortunately, but we got ahead before it fully collapsed. Um, and then completing some of the paving projects. And then the last one really is everything else. Everything else that you expect when you walk up and you want to get a library book or a permit, um, where you need uh, help with your utility bill, where you need to place a call for service with our police team, you can go to the next one. Um, you know, it's about 80 or 90% of what we do is the ongoing daily operational services. Um, and all the other things are trying to make that better so that we can be more effective and more efficient. I think that's our aspirations. If you want, I put this in the document so that you can click on our work plan and go into greater detail. You could also click on our budget and read the whole darn thing if you want, um, or just the highlight, the, the, the very front part, to understand how those mechanics work. So those are resources for you. And then I guess my final thoughts are really around, here we are right now with a chance for dialogue um, I might get a little outside, kind of over my skis and say how one of my big uh, desires is for us as a community to create a culture of engagement and one that is um, productive and, um, you know, it doesn't mean we agree on everything, but it means that we're all kind of pulling in the same general direction for making ourselves a better community. I think we have a huge amount of that in our community, unlike many places I've ever been. Um, of course, not everyone's on that bus. And I think, how do we, um, as a larger community, invite people to participate? Because if you're leaving it to just a city, we're not gonna be able to do it all. We really need, I mean, all the volunteers, all the organizations we work with, um, you know, that's really the lifeblood of how we accomplish things in, in this community. And without that, we can't really do anything. So um, I, that's my wish, is how do we work together to that, to that end so that we're, you know, we're engaged and not enraged. You know, we can actually participate together in a way that um, makes this place better and, and, you know, has honest, com you know, conversations about our shortcomings. Um, but especially in a community, in a society where we continue to get a little bit more polarized, and, you, know, um, you know, trust in local government is pr probably low. Um, how do we kind of get outside that box and actually work together? That is my plea. And then some framing questions uh, for discussion, but I'm gonna pass it to Mayor Faber um, thank you for your patience with me. <laughs> Thanks, that was fantastic, John. Yeah, that, that piece about um, I think respectful uh, engagement and communication is, is so key, and I love this community for how effective we are at having thoughtful conversations for the most part. You know, it doesn't always work out that way, but uh, you know, this is a great community, and um, I'm hoping that we can continue that this morning with some, some great discussion. So, do we want to turn it to? Yeah, could I? Yeah. Um, so, if you, I, we oh, encourage yeah. people to talk. This is being there are a lot of folks who are virtual with us today. So, thank you for joining virtually. I can't see you, but I know you're there. Um, for everybody to hear virtually, those who have questions or want to have uh, make comments or kind of engage in dialogue, you can go to the podium here so people can hear you. That's the only thing we ask. Yeah, thank you, John. I always forget those procedural pieces that are, you know, theoretically the most, the, the core function of my job. <laughs> um, okay, do we have, uh, did we have a sign up for questions or how do we, nope. Okay. No um, three minute rule. I mean, yeah, this is free form. Free form, I love it. <laughs> Normally it's so much more structured in council meetings. Um, so maybe what we can start with is seeing if anyone in the room has any comment or questions, things they want to talk about. Yeah, Jason, if you want to step up and if everyone can just identify themselves so that everyone participating can, yes. can know who we all are. Where is the on? Hello? Can you? No, it's not on. Okay. I can speak loudly, but they won't hear me. Bottom. Yes. Can you hear me now? No. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Does this go to the Zoom? Okay, everyone will be able to hear me. Yay. Um, so forget about this, everybody. Um, 
So uh, we did talk about problems with the pool, which was one of the big divisive things in this county that has really been played for all it's worth and its mother. And I'd love to know what your vision is of how to get beyond this division, because it is the division that's playing out in the election and that we're experiencing everywhere. And how you, I noticed that there was talk of maybe adopting a less expensive pool, um, you know, plan. Uh, there's been the letter in the leader from the former, 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 former mayor. Um, so I'm wondering what your plan is to move forward and how to engage people in a positive way so that people don't see this as a Port Townsend fluff project as opposed to something that serves everyone in this county. It's a great question. Um, that could go to either one of us in different parts. I mean, John's been much more directly engaged in the planning process here. So I have not been on the, 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 the committee that was reviewing the various technical components. But I'm a big proponent of having an aquatic facility in our community. I mean, we are a maritime economy here on jutting out into the uh, the Salish Sea, uh, where we have water temperatures. What is it? Like 43 out there? Um, you know, it's you can't just throw a kid in the water and expect them to learn to swim. But kids do need to learn how to swim in this community. And we have a current public pool that is saying it's on its last legs. It was charitable to the pool. I mean, it has toppled over multiple times, and we've had to stitch it back together with bubble gum and duct tape. And uh, it, it's going to need to be replaced in, in fairly short term. I mean, we're not going to be able to keep this, this existing pool going for long. Keep in mind also the existing pool, even if we did an exact replica rebuild of it, wouldn't meet the community needs because it's 90% the length of competition pool, meaning our local swim team, our, our, our kids here, wouldn't be able to uh, hold their swim meets in uh, Port Townsend or in Jefferson County. Um, and, you know, it, there's also temperature concerns over you know, different uses of the pool, which is why the, uh, the, the proposal has, a, has two tanks, two pools. One of the reasons why it has two, two tanks. Um, yeah, this is it's a big challenge because I, I think John mentioned there were some partial reports that people used to misinterpret and drive a wedge uh, on this on this topic. I mean, I, how to go through this? I think one is anyone who knows public works projects, knows government funded projects for a facility of that size, 4.1 million, which is the number of people like to quote as like the cost that would you know that these reports theoretically said it would cost to do the rebuild, there's there's no way you're going to build a, a facility of that size for $4.1 million. It just, with prevailing wage rules and all the, the issues around uh, around public construction, there's just there's no conceivable way. The actual number is closer to, I think, $21 million uh, in, to do a rebuild. Keep in mind, too, that is the total figure that the current proposal is looking for taxpayer funding. This is the same amount that it would cost to do a total rebuild. The important distinction here is and, and just rebuilding this existing building would not uh, would not be able to, to garner much in the way of grant funding, philanthropic dollars, um, all the additional support that the community, what, what this plan, the existing plan, was going to go out for to find the other half of the funds to build the roughly $40 million between 38 and 41, I think, million dollar, um, uh, much, much better facility. Um, so, yeah, the, but your question, Jason, is about how to get past it. That's a great question. I think that's that's one that ultimately comes to the community, is how does this get discussed in a way that is, um, you know, that recognizes the complexity of this information, instead of just taking a little sound bite or a little piece of misinformation and running with it how do we get this more broadly discussed in the community and using the correct numbers and the correct thoughts about um correct thoughts is a really bad phrase <laughs> the 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 a, a thoughtful analysis of the the you know correct information about how we we proceed forward with having the aquatic facility in our community um yeah john do you have anything you want to 
Yeah, no, I, I think that that's really that's a really great um, perspective on why why <clears throat> that's the why what's at stake. Um, I'll back up and just say let's just talk process because that's kind of my job. <laughs> it's unfortunately uh, the the sausage making of the process. So um, maybe a couple things I, I just want to share because I appreciate the question, Jason. And I think you know I I I live in this soup of uncertainty all the time and. Uh, and frankly, disappointment that you know we can't kind of rise above the, the throwing food at each other kind of thing. Um, so one thing I want to dispel myths. I mean, as Mayor Faber said, you know there were some reports that were I believe intentionally misrepresented as holistic when they were not. So that four million means something, but it means one slice of something larger. So the real number is 21. So it's already we're already like you know almost an order of magnitude off. Um, and yeah, it's expensive. So I'm not going to say whether it's a good idea or bad. Um, Mayor Faber covered that. But we need to be making a decision as a community with the right information so that we're not on completely different universes of what's possible. Because you know what? If we could build something reasonable for four million bucks and not 21, I would be the first one to want to champion that because it would be obviously a better thing for our taxpayer rate base, for our community, for our financial sustainability. It would be it would be a no-brainer. Um, so. Um, let's make sure that we can kind of come back to what the real information is. All those reports are available on, on the city website, the, the holistic approach. How to move forward, um, I'll answer the procedural question a little differently too. Um, the, today, actually, one of the things I get to do is go to the county commission meeting where uh, the Jefferson County, county uh, uh, Board of County Commissioners is, is getting a briefing on this. So if you want to learn more, go there today. Um, and the steering group met last week and talked through, okay, um, uh, through, through an approach that involves a task force appointed by county commissioners, so that's why it's coming to county commissioners, um, to look at two things. One is location, because that's an open question. Um, the steering group looked at ideal locations and for reasons related to sewer capacity, frankly, and infrastructure, and vehicle miles travel, and available land, and a number of other things. There are four locations that were chosen for possibility of the city, uh, one of them being where the current pool is, and that was what the state, uh, the steering group recommended. Still recommends, by the way. Um, but we realized that this dialogue is open up about, well, is this the optimal location? Well, okay, let's, let's look at that. So the task force will be tasked with uh, what would an outside city limits um, uh, location look like, and um, also, um, what if the physical infrastructure is different? You know, we met with a group that does more like canopy style pop up, um, you know, facilities. Well, let's give that an honest look. You know, we met with them. What would the task force say of what they dig into the detail on whether that's a viable option? Is it something, you know, frankly, it'd be something. But the general assessment that we did in the report is uh, cheaper upfront, longer term uh, operations cost. If that's a trade-off we want to make as a community, okay, let's take the cheap option up front and you know pay pay the maintenance over time. Um, those are things that the task force is going to be wrestling with for two or three months from now after they're appointed by the county commission. Um, and how to engage as a community? Well, that's a great place to engage. It'll come back to the steering group, come back to the governing bodies, and we'll have more information. I think one of the, the other things I want to dispel, and I don't want to make this all you know diatribe about the pool for the, the whole time here, but is um, the subsidy actually flows the opposite way. And I think that's the unfortunate thing about this sort of movement of, you know, the city's, you know, infrastructure. If, if it makes sense outside the city, you know, we want to look at all options. But right now, our, our taxpayer base pays about $400,000 to subsidize the pool. And I know that because of the budget. I also know that because I bumped into our facilities manager this morning and he told me that the boiler was out and the staff spent a lot of Sunday and, and about five o'clock this morning at the pool trying to get it going without having to close it because they realize there are classes there that people depend on for wellness. As Mayor Faber said, you know, the last legs is charitable. I mean, there are no legs. And, you know, we keep on putting duct tape over duct tape over duct tape. And it's kind of a miracle only related to the city team that's working on the facilities team that it's still operational. So um, I want to bring up that number because that's, an, that's, that's what we currently subsidize plus through council last year, late last year, $100,000 roof fix, and it just keeps being, frankly, a money pit. Um, a new facility would not be that way because we wouldn't be trying to kind of continually upgrade a facility that's built in 1963, decades past its useful life. Um, 
But the narrative I've heard out in the wider community is, why do we need to subsidize this thing for the city? Well, a lot of the users are outside, not just uh, 98368, um, you know, or sorry, not just outside the city, but also outside the zip code. So people using it from all around the county. Um, and currently the city subsidizes the use. So if this were to go somewhere else outside the city limits, that $400,000 subsidy would be potentially in jeopardy. I mean, we'd want to play an active role in partnership, I believe, and have to go through council, it's not my call. Um, but, um, you know, I think the misperception is, why are we subsidizing for PT? Well, frankly, there is a user fee, people pay to get in, but the base cost and the operations is subsidized by the city taxpayer and the rest of the county benefits from that. Probably, well, I was gonna say enough, but Mayor Faber has more. <laughs> I just wanted to say one more little thing in terms of the, uh, the public facilities district sales tax proposal would amount to about $1.66 per person per month uh, in sales tax expenditures. Like it's like half a cup of coffee to have an aquatic facility in our community. And in terms of the location, John spoke to this a, a little bit, but um, you know, the, the city of Port Townsend is the densest part of Jefferson County at, at about 30-ish percent of the total county population that was in the city limits. And then right outside the city, we have a lot of additional population. A location of a pool in the city limits here is going to be most efficient for most people in the community to be able to get to the pool with minimal, uh, minimizing the number of uh, vehicle miles driven, which if we care about climate change, if we care about um, you know wear and tear on infrastructure, it's going to be less expensive in the long term to have a facility in Port Townsend, no matter what its you know material is. You know, John spoke about that pop-up building long-term probably costing our community more, which, by the way, I always uh, hate to try and shunt off long-term costs on future generations. We need to start making some hard decisions now about how to make sure our community is sustainable in the future. Um, but uh, yeah, there's, there's so many reasons why the location in the city limits makes the most sense. Uh, and yeah, I, I hope we can find a way to get there because we, we need an aquatic facility in our community. Hope that was a suitable answer for your question. <laughs> we, we went a little long on that yeah, one. Yeah, that was so, pretty long. <laughs> we can are, shift gears. There are no, there are no simple answers. Yes, so that's exactly right, Jason. Indeed. 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 Thank you. All right, do we have anyone else in the room? Yes, please. Press the podium if you would and identify yourself. Mary Kellogg. Uh, we talk a lot about all of the housing that's needed, but how about the services? that we really need so that we're not spending so much of our time in Silverdale and Squim, and especially for young families, children. I, I don't see any place they can afford to buy any clothing. I, I think that needs to be addressed in the future. It's a great question. Uh, great, you know, this has been, that's that question. So she, yeah, um, uh, we were asked about, uh, services of the community and you know affordable services including like shops for buying things that people in the community need so they're not having to go to Silverdale or Squim to do shopping. So this is a this has been a live issue since I was a kid here. Um, I remember talking to people about frustrations about not being able and feeling myself about like every time I wanted to buy anything I had to go to a different community. Yeah, this is a real tough one. We've had a number of different, uh, you know, box stores and so forth look at Port Townsend as a potential location. There, it's ultimately comes down to like behavioral economics, and their market survey doesn't support citing businesses in the city limits because of population densities. And people will travel distances to go to to shops. We're right here at the end of this little peninsula, which is a blessing and a curse for us that it's really hard to get these kind of businesses located in Port Townsend. Um, now, the, others, the other component of that is that you're talking about services beyond you know, shopping and so forth. We do have a lot of things that we need to have in Port Townsend, things that we need to have that, um, you know, providing everything from you know, medical care to, uh, again, aquatics. I mean, we have a ton. You talk to any young family with kids in Port Townsend right now, 
and they're driving to Port Angeles or Silverdale to take their kids to do swim lessons um, predominantly. I mean, that's, that's they're much better pool facilities. If we want them to not have to go to those other communities, and while they're there, by the way, probably buying food and doing other things out and spending money in those communities, if we want those people to be able to, to remain here in town, that's, well, that's one of the, the things we have to consider. Also, in terms of like medical care or just having teachers and firefighters and so forth able to live in this community to provide the services we need, we need the housing. That's hugely important. So, I mean, it, I know this isn't going to the, the, the retail side of your question, but one of the other things is, I mean, this is all synergetic. It's all, it all builds together with when you have those population densities, if we can create the sufficient housing to meet the needs of the community, those questions about whether or not a shop could locate here to provide the retail opportunities may look different, right? It's all of these things kind of coalesce together. They have to work together to, to come to a end result, which is what the comp plan is, is hugely about. Um, and I think we, you know, and, and I was a participant in 2016 on the comp plan, current comp plan, right? Um, I think that was a big missed opportunity. And so I'm looking forward to this new, we're working on this comp plan update now, and I'm looking forward very much to trying addressing a lot of these exact issues, because I think we have to, we really have to answer some big, tough questions on those services locally. So we aren't having people just have to drive to other communities to buy things, to do things that are needed, all that. Great question. I just don't like driving places. <laughs> and that, that's part of why I love this town is that, you you know, if you live in town or nearby, you can kind of get around uh, by foot, by bike, or by a short car trip or by transit. And it's all right at your fingertips. Um, my only add to that really great statement question is, um, it's kind of a meta question for the community. Are, are we up for change? Because things have to change to get to that vision. We have more available locally. And what are we willing to give up? And we, we certainly don't want to give up what makes this place beautiful and amazing and creative and collaborative. I mean, th th there's like some sacred you know, things about Port Towns that I don't think anybody wants to change. So let the comp plan be a place where we cement those values in written form and say, this is what we stand for. Those things that we need to change or we don't get what you're asking for, like what our economic development looks like, like what our housing stuff looks like. Um, if we don't do that, we can't have what we're looking for in terms of access to services. So those trade-offs, I don't think are well understood by everybody. I mean, I'll be honest, they're complicated and I don't understand some of that, but we're actively trying to understand how to create a vibrant quality community where you have services that aren't outside and we're investing in our own so i think the vision stump up to the comp plan that's an awesome contribution to the to the vision of what we want to be by 2045. i have a question that just goes along with that smart maps um so we are charged sales tax and everything that we purchase online if i purchase but instead of going to the best buy store in silverdale to buy a computer for instance if i buy that online and have that delivered does the senate does the city benefit from the sales tax in that regard Yes, it was a nice change in what's called the. Um, That's called the setup. I know. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, there's. I, I'm a lawyer in my day job, and I worked for the Department of Revenue back in 2011, uh, talking about this exact issue of sales tax. Uh, and there's a change in the way that the, the rules are interpreted to allow for what's called substantial nexus in the community when you order something online the location where the good was sent from the warehouse used to be how where the sales taxes were collected now it's the destination so ordering things online is potentially actually better for the community than going to silverdale or going to to swim um, plus if there's there's some efficiencies if there's one big truck delivering things to port townsend rather than a thousand cars going out of the community that is one consideration Thank you. There's probably, I, I feel compelled to say this because my wife's in the audience. Um, there's kind of, <laughs> there's a, um, uh, maybe a hierarchy of decision making where, uh, you know, if you can support a local business here in Port Townsend, by all means, we, we try, we try really hard. I know you try really hard to find what we need locally because we have to, I mean, we don't like, I don't like buying stuff. We, it's inevitable. You need, you know, shoes. Um, 
try that first. And then, and then actually, yeah, um, ordering online is better than driving outside the community and dumping sales tax because those sales tax dollars contribute to building better streets and public services. Um, but boy, it would be nice to have better options. I think back to your point. So I, I, I try, we try to work through that hierarchy and it's painful <laughs> sometimes because it's obviously easier just to be like, no, I have to order something that's in talking to you right now. It's pretty simple. But if we want our local community and our local business environment to thrive, we all need to kind of think about the, the, the nexus of those decisions and, and how it benefits a better community. Hi, I'm Mark Cooper, um, and my question has to do directly with what you talked about, John, and that's the flow of information, uh, an absolutely critical issue. So we'll use the pool as one example, and unfortunately I'll use Sherry Street as another example. But in the pool, I know where I can go to hear all those counter arguments, um, and some of them are compelling, to be very honest. Um, and if I travel out to Brennan, where I was, you know, last week, we all know how they feel just about anything that has to do with the city, you know, and asking them for a pool tax and that. But I don't know where to go for the city's counter arguments against these uh, these types of things. Um, and the second one has to do with Cherry Street. Very unfortunately. I was part of that. I was on the board. Um, and long story made short, if the city council had actually gotten all the honest information before Cherry Street had happened, I don't think it ever would have happened because it was quite honestly pretty much doomed to fail before it even started. And so the flow of information is a critical, critical issue. How do you guys see addressing that? Um, you can start off. Okay. I have some thoughts. Yeah, I think maybe that, thanks, Mark. I really appreciate it, Mark. I think that's uh, partly why we're here today. Um, and so maybe in, in two parts here. Um, one is you can go somewhere. You know, there actually is a place. So there is a place that's actually probably oversubscribed with information, for instance, on the pool. Um, and so every, all the reports and all the public presentations and all the survey results and everything is available on cityofpt.us slash engage. And it's one of the initiatives on the left side of the uh, website. Um, but I take your point because wading through all of that is challenging. And so we need to do a better job at synthesizing information and assuming that people don't have you know, three hours to pour through them. Um, and that's on us. So that's partly why we want to get better at that, partly why we're doing things like this, partly why we're here today, to be able to tell a better, more compelling, more succinct story. The other thing, I think the second part of my um, answer would be um, it's a partnership. And, and I think I'm, uh, I'm aware that we have a, a real serious responsibility, for, I mean, legal responsibility for putting information out there publicly and transparently. And um, people have, a, I think, a duty, a civic duty to inform themselves. Um, and so, you know, that's on you. <laughs> um, because I think if you, if you expect, you know, I hear sometimes, well, I didn't see it, in, you know, on the website or we want to know where our blind spots are. But if people assume they can find information or have it, you know, broadcast to them individually, we just don't have the capacity to do that. You know, we're, we're doing the best we can to get out in multiple channels. A lot of these things actually, I mean, I don't want to take personal credit, but we, we're doing things in the last four years we've never done as a city before. We're on the radio, we produce this, we have a new report, we're on Facebook, you know, I meet for coffee with the community every Friday, every uh, first Friday of the month. I mean, there's a ton of things that we're doing now we never did before. Because we believe your statement about flow of information, we want the flow of information to be there. And my request is, dig in. I was just talking to some lovely folks earlier about who, done, frankly, done your homework. You you get informed, you read stuff, and then you have the opinion about where we should go as a community. I think that's. I know you're the same way. I know you're informed. You dig in, um, but not everybody uh, takes that responsibility to participate in the partnership with the city. So please, there's places to get informed and engaged. Yeah, thanks for that, John. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, um, I just wanted to speak really quickly about Cherry Street. One thing to note is that virtually all the staff that was involved in the Cherry Street decision are no longer at the city, and only two of the seven council members are the same. There's been significant turnover, so I mean, put blame on me. I was on council at the time, by all means, but there's a lot of folks who are now involved in the city that had no relationship whatsoever to the decisions that got us uh, to the, the Carmel building being located on, on that, that property next to the, the golf course and the church over there. Um, in terms of that 
Yeah, John spoke to, you know, there's some important lessons that we very much learned uh, coming out of, of the, you know, having to work through and eventually demolish the Cherry Street building. Um, yeah, it was, it was a, a deep frustration that it, it couldn't go forward uh, successfully. We, at the time, and you know, was it 2017? I think when we took the vote to to barge the building over, uh, we were told basically we had a day to make the decision. The building was going to be demolished in BC, and if we didn't act on it and get that building for a dollar, we would miss out on uh, what appeared to be a potentially great opportunity. Now it was definitely a risk, and the risk did not play out. But we already had a housing crisis then. It's gotten way worse since then. It was a, I mean, you're right. It was a shot in the dark, so to speak. We didn't have a lot of information that would have been very useful to have. Um, it looked like an opportunity at the time. And it's really unfortunate that basically everything ended up being stacked against that project. I mean, it just failed in every conceivable way. So. Can I? Sorry, I, I did one one more thing. I think um, some things have changed since then, and I'm not. I, so on one hand, this is a mixed message, so get your brain ready. On one hand, um, we've got a different team also. In a way, we work together internally, which you know you don't usually get to see, but if you come to council, you can see our planning director, our public works director, you know, sitting together in partnership, being at all the same meetings together and working together. Unlike I don't think we've had in a long time, um, you know, and so the synergy amongst people looking for the blind spots and trying to figure out you know, solutions to tough problems is, I'd say, at a pretty high right now. I have high confidence in my team to be smart and strategic and not to step into it <laughs> in a blunder. And mixed message, um, we're going to make mistakes. You know, that's just the fact of the matter. And, and, and actually, if we're not taking risks, especially on some of our most difficult issues like housing, we're, I'm going to argue we're probably not pushing it hard. You know, we don't want to make a risk and have it all fall down, but I think you can expect that we're going to take some steps in the wrong direction after pull back. Hopefully not to the tune of what we just demolished. Uh, we don't want to take any big risks like that, but, you know, it doesn't mean we're, you know, I read the memos. So it was before my time. I take responsibility for it, but I went back and I looked at the memos and the city manager at the time said, yeah, there's a risk with this project. You know, it was stated and decisions were made. So I think, you know, that's the same thing with a lot of things we're doing right now. So. Um, help us see the blind spots and participate so that we don't really step in next time. Hi, I'm Leslie Rubel. Let, let me start out with before my question is say thank you. Jackman Street is being torn up right now by the fairgrounds and getting fixed. Yay! <laughs> Ooh, sorry, it's been on the menu for a while. It has. Um, my question has to do with our partnership with the county. I have a lot of family living in the county. They're sort of oblivious to their problem with not having a sewer system, blah, 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 blah. So we feel like the island who has a sewer system and everything's ducky on our side. And what is the partnership going on with Jefferson County? We can have more stores and things and things and things down in Jefferson County if they have a bloody sewer system, et cetera, et cetera. So, Thank you for addressing the question is, what is our partnership with our partners? I'm happy to take some of that. John's been, by the way, a visionary leader in partnership along with Aaron Berg in the back, the port and other, um, other part, you know, the other partners, um, including the county, who have in the last few years really come together in a way that this community maybe never has. I mean, we've been having meetings in this very room uh, quarterly right now to coordinate between these different bodies to make sure we're all working together because there's a finite collection of resources, finite amount of time, and uh, frankly, we need to be able to work together to be stronger and coalitions can usually do more than individual groups. Um, now, I mean, this, the additional sewer capacity in the county, I mean, the, the county is working on the sewer in Hadlock. That's something that I, I don't think we're the right people to talk about. Um, now, yeah, but to your question about, or you said things are ducky and that's <laughs> having a sewer. Our sewer system is in not great shape. 
Um, we just had to approve significant rate increases on uh, our, our monthly sewer bills. And you'll start seeing that. Uh, unfortunately, we had this is a 12% annual or you know 12% increase in the sewer rate each of the next five years. What's that? 13. I'm sorry. Even worse. <laughs> It's it's tough. I mean, it's it's a real significant issue, and it's, and it's going to hit people. Um, but it's the alternative to that was pushing off yet again, making those hard decisions on the future generations to pay even more. We had a report to to council looking at potential for like four hundred dollar sewer bills in uh, what was it like ten or fifteen years if we didn't start doing the the hard work and making the hard decisions to pay a little bit more now. Um, now, that said, we also, with John's fantastic staff, uh, came up with a really great uh, progressive rate structure that kind of tries to, to fix some of the, the worst impacts of these rate increases up to people making, I think, 350% area median income, which I don't remember the, the dollar amounts. 350% poverty rate, so that's about 120% area median income, which is, you know, it, it depends on how many people in your household, but basically we're trying to make our um, uh, utility discount program applicable to five or six times the amount of people it's currently applicable to. Right. So like that's going to help us um, help the community kind of eat those additional costs. I mean, really there are going to be a few people who are kind of middle income here potentially even they're going to see a cut in their their monthly sewer bill now that means that those of us who make a little bit more money have more resources we're going to be paying more um, but i think that's that's the sort of, sort of solution the kind of progressive um, financing of our necessary infrastructure that, that this community really supports so um, more on that will be i'm sure discussed in the future but that's something that i think is really important for people to take from from our what we're doing right now as a city. I'm going to bite on the ducky comment and then I'm going to let people go because I feel like it's, it's about that time. Um, but um, it, it will stick around, I think. I can at least stick around and continue to converse. But um, maybe maybe one thing, this is a good way to go out, I think. I mean, um, I'm, I'm a realist and so there's some stuff that's absolutely broken we're trying to fix and, and that's unavoidable and I'll be straight up about it. And there are some things and some dynamics that are better than I think they've been, maybe ever or at least in a long time. And one of those things, I mean, Mayor Faber gives you know credit here with staff, but really there are 16 elected officials, you know, three of which Aaron Berg reports to, seven of which I do, same thing with county, same thing with PUD, that do come together every quarter. And you know, we, I mean, it's, I don't sound trite, but we've won national awards for that coalition of leaders that has um, started to work together in ways that, you know, frankly, we used to feud really well. I mean, Aaron and I read all the background, you know, legal briefs and stuff. It's it's kind of astonishing the opportunity costs of like warring agencies. I mean, basically who loses? Well, the public, you know? And so just realizing that we all have to, I mean, we have some hard conversations and we disagree about stuff, um, but I think in terms of stabilizing interagency dynamics, it's, it's not been like this for a really long time, if ever. And that's really kudos to the elected officials who are the ones who are up for that. You know, and I also, I also want to give a shout out to the other council member in the room, Owen Rowe. I mean, you're part of the intergovernmental collaborative group and, and, and have the idea of not just what's best for the city, but what's best in the region in mind as you work together. And that's a new thing. And we've got a lot of catch up to do because it's about time. So maybe it's fair to say thank you. Um, oh, maybe, I mean, I, I'm happy to keep going, but I, I don't want people to feel like they've got to make a rude exit. If you have to leave, maybe just get up and go for it. No shame at all. Um, we'll take one more and then we'll just, um, we'll have a more informal chat. Yeah, I mean, do, or, is there a hard stop time on this? So Aaron, how long do we have the building? All day. Next week. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can stay here till 11, but uh, that's 11 now. All right, I'm mean, sorry, at noon, uh, another hour. Okay, I'll make this works. Um, oh, one is I want to, um, I guess the short, short two-parter. Um, one is, um, um, I've been working on, with with the city on a, on a early stages of the new uh, water contract for the mill, and I really appreciate that um, that's resulted in the mill sharing the cost of their water, bringing in an extra four and a half million dollars to the city coffers. 
So, and, and also doing the set aside for future repairs. So that had been neglected from the previous history of the, of the, um, of their relationship. So I really appreciate that. Um, my question to you is a lot of these initiatives involve, um, have been involving um, paving, building over, um, cutting down, and so on, like uh, covering up the national environment. And I'm wondering, okay, um, natural environment has been shown to be essential to, to human health and well-being. And um, I'm wondering how, whether um, pre offsets for preservation of open space and open land um, has been included in the discussions or is being included in the discussions, because I haven't really been seeing that. And I think it's essential. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. So, I mean, I think the, there's no question that uh, the green space, the natural environment is essential for well-being of humanity um, and for this community. That's definitely in uh, the back of my mind as I talk about density or all of the stuff we're talking about in terms of building additional anything. Like if we densify the city of Port Townsend, have more housing built closer into the core, that's allowing us to offset building that would happen in, you know, outside the city limits and tear down far more trees. Just because we don't see a tree at a moment, you know, if you see, you see a, a, some trees get knocked down on a lot, still probably fewer trees than what happens if you end up having to pave a road on a five acre parcel to build a house and a drain field for septic and a, a, a well and all the additional destruction that would happen around that. So there's there's a trade-off and, and no question, more people means more environmental destruction. You know, if we, we don't have the ability to just cast the community in amber and, and you know, stop any additional development from happening. The development, I believe, firmly should be happening in the city of Port Townsend at as dense a, a rate possible. Also building up doesn't destroy more trees, right? That's another important detail. Now, there's also no question that having sufficient parks and uh, natural spaces in every neighborhood in the city is important. There's ongoing discussion about how we expand our park system uh, to be more equitable citywide. Um, and there's a ton of, we, we have partnerships with uh, Jefferson Land Trust uh, and, you know, Cappy's Trails is significantly protected. There's um, other parts of this community that there are strong protections like Kaita uh, Lagoon. There's not going to be um, any significant development there, if any development there, um, in part because there's a, a lot of uh, thoughtful work done over the last, you know, 35, 40 years on on that natural space. It's It's been part of the consideration all along. It's also important to note that one of the things that we're doing with uh, the sewer rate increases is starting out at a 50 cent and going to a $1 uh, monthly uh, stormwater charge that's going to be significantly directed towards urban forestry. Uh, basically making sure that we have um, good rain gardens and good trees planted in the rights of way to increase exactly that the, the tree canopy that causes cooling in an urban environment and um, is better for human health, mental health, physical health, all of the above. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate the, the question, the thought on that. That's definitely top of mind. And when we talk about the additional density in building, it's actually specifically I mean, one of the many components, one of the many things that the fed, um, the synergies fed by density is environmental protection. It, it helps preserve more of the natural environment. I'll just tack on to that and say uh, plus one. <laughs> and um, I mean, it's part of why I'm here. You know, I mean, who's not here because it's a beautiful place to live, a great quality of life. I mean, that like we don't want to let go of that, right? So I, I really appreciate the question and how to sustain that over the long term and balance it with a wider perspective. The previous question: How do we work regionally with the county to make sure that overall our region looks healthier, greener, more environmentally, you know, integrity? Um, that's that's not just the Port Townsend thing. So to some degree, yes, you know, it means us accepting growth as the state requires. And, and also back to the previous question, working in partnership with the county on population growth allocations and comprehensive planning, the teams are working, you know, just super well together daily 
um, to get that right for the region because it's so important. And yeah, we don't want to make any trade-offs that make this place less great and lovely. Um, last week, it was it was pleasing for us to get a $350,000 grant award on urban forestry. It's our second urban forestry grant we've gotten just this past six months. And that's a big part of the comprehensive plan. So what they, uh, Mayor Faber is speaking to, how do we wrap urban forestry into what a dense, high quality of life, you know, vital town looks like? I can't, I mean, there are trade-offs. And I like to maximize both having our cake and eating it too. I really like to maximize like, what a great quality, um, you know, compact urban form and green space can mean. And I really feel like Port Townsend could be an exemplar for not just the region, but, but far beyond. So help us with that too. We, we, need, we need people to come in and say, okay, how do we make those trade-offs? And you know, it's pretty gruesome to imagine what Mayor Faber just said. Okay, knock down five acres for the drain field, the, the road, the, you know, I mean, that, that's what we're talking about. There's available land without a single a tree on it. And, and a lot of, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, speak to the sacred cap in uptown. You know, I mean, that's a great place to put more people to fuel local businesses on transit, uh, walkable with parks, um, where actually people are contributing to the quality of life in our town and getting to that sales tax question earlier too at the same time. That's probably enough out of me. Um, <laughs> if people, <laughs> people want to keep going or maybe let's break more informally. You can kind of get up, stretch, grab some coffee, a donut, and um, come, you know, swarm David and I. We've got 45 minutes if you want to keep talking. And thank you so much. Thanks for the team for putting this on. For Councilmember Rowe and Mayor Faber for being here, our agency partners, Port of Port Townsend for hosting. Um, and I'll let you have the last word, Mr. Mayor. I just realized we didn't go to our online participants. Do we have any way for them to ask questions? We do, yeah. No, they have their hands up right now. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I would be remiss if we didn't give them an opportunity to participate. Sorry to step on what you were saying, John, but I just realized we have people who can't be here physically right now. And I don't want to discount their ability to participate. Um, so if anyone is joining us online, there's a raise your hand little button you can press. Melissa's watching it studiously to see if anyone does. No hands up. No hands going up. Okay. Um, all right. Well, we'll go back to what John was saying then. So yeah, maybe we can just have some more informal discussions. So thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Hey.